All right, let's go ahead and get started. So first today, uh, I want to give you guys an update on uh, the research um, in terms of what we're seeing in terms of nest box choice and, and the number of eggs and number of fledged birds. And then a lot of our birds have now uh, started their second nest. And so looking at that choice as well and whether they switched uh, boxes. So we've had 23 nests uh, that uh, birds have laid eggs in. Um, 13 of those are first nesting. So 13 of our 20 sites are occupied. Uh, and we now have 10 of our pairs on their second nesting. Now, first nesting choice, um, we had eight NABs boxes and uh, five FBS, Florida Bluebird Society boxes. And then at our second nesting choice, we had six NABs, uh, three FBSs, uh, and one Gilbertson. So of our 10 second nesting, seven of the birds switched boxes after their first nesting. Now, two of these were nest failures, but in all the others, they were, as far as we can tell, uh, all the or all the eggs hatched and all the birds fledged for seven uh, for eight uh, of our second nestings the first nesting uh, had, was successful and but there were two failures um, and yeah seven of the ten birds switched and I think that might be related to just it's a nice good box nearby very similar but it's clean of uh, nesting material and parasites and so easy to switch. Um, so we've had 105 eggs laid in our boxes, 65 eggs in NABs boxes, 34 eggs in FBS boxes, and six eggs in a Gilbertson. We've only had one Gilbertson. The average, though, number of eggs per nest uh, box is, is identical. So uh, no difference there so far. Might be a slight preference for the NABs boxes, um, but uh, I'd say the bigger effect is there's a preference for NABs and Florida Bluebird Society boxes over the Gilbertson. Now we've had two complete nest failures. So that uh, that's when no eggs hatched um, from all the eggs laid. In both of those cases, the birds that were on their first nesting of the year, they each laid five eggs and none of those eggs hatched. Those both occurred in NABs boxes. Now, we also had one errant egg that was laid in a box without a nest. Now, that egg didn't hatch either. Now, we've, uh, we've pulled those eggs out and we've uh, uh, candled them with our phone uh, to sort of see what was inside. And um, the egg, errant egg was, uh, showed no signs of de development at all. Uh, and the first nest failure showed no signs of development. Now, the second nest failure showed some very early signs of development, but they abandoned that uh, box for some reason and moved to a nearby box. Now, in our second nesting, we've got two nests uh, with what we suspect is partial nest failure. So they each had laid five eggs, but only three of those eggs have hatched, and now there's no signs of the other eggs. Um, and those are one uh, occurred once in a NABs box and once in a Florida Bluebird Society box. Now, in terms of fledge su success, uh, we've had 10 nests that have fledged. Um, that uh, is 47 birds from those 10 nests. Uh, pretty even in terms of the numbers. We've had four NABs nests completely fledge, five FBS nests nest fledge, and one Gilbertson. And currently, we have 100% fledge rate from hatched eggs. So if the eggs hatched, they fledged. Um, we've had no predation events and no images from our camera suggesting any predation attempts. And uh, uh, almost all of our cameras uh, have a complete view of the box and the pole. So we should be able to see any attempts to even climb the pole uh, as well. And so we're not seeing that. Now, interestingly, we've got cameras and we, uh, we've got cameras directly facing these nest boxes, and we've been really hoping to get images of birds fledging, of them leaving with our trail cams. And so far, we haven't been successful doing that. And even, even when we've beefed up the sensitivity uh, and increased um, the length of the, the cameras, uh, of the images and videos they're taking, uh, and decreased the time between to try to really capture uh, video, uh, of the birds leaving, and we've never captured it. And I, I suspect it's just simply the cameras 
a little too far away to get that quick sort of uh, hop fall out of the box that the, those birds are doing. Because um, we get plenty of nice videos uh, of the mothers of the male and female bluebirds coming in and feeding the young. And so with that, we're able to know pretty precisely when uh, the birds fledge because the, the male and females quit returning to the nest with, with uh, food for them. Now, I've got a little video here. This is our Gilbertson, or the couple at our Gilbertson. So I'll show this as a swooping behavior. They were really uh, protective of their Gilbertson's uh, nest, these birds. So these birds, uh, um, they had originally had nested in a nabs box, and that was the one that was completely sterile, didn't develop at all, even though they incubated it for quite a long time. And, and then they have finally abandoned it. Uh, that nest and moved to the nearby Gilbertson, and then they were extremely protective of that nest. Uh, and you can see that they were doing that swooping behavior. Both the male and females from these branches would swoop down at us pretty much nonstop anytime we visited this nest box. Just like that. Pretty neat. Now, here is uh, the birds in the Gilbertsons. They laid uh, six eggs in here, so it was quite crowded. Um, this is a few days before they left. Uh, the box, and we were actually able to stand pretty far back and zoom in with our just our phone camera uh, to get this image. So we weren't disturbing the birds uh, overly much. And then here's the inside after they left. Um, so kind of kind of amazing that they fit six full-sized uh, fledglings in there, but they did, and they all left successfully. Now. An important topic that we're basically at at this point, because we have a lot of our nests that have uh, finished uh, their first nest and birds have fledged, is whether or not you clean uh, the nest box uh, and how you do that. And so absolutely you need to clean the nest box uh, at the end of the breeding season, but there is a little bit of debate over cleaning nest boxes between nestings. Because bluebirds will not remove their old nesting material, so they're simply going to continue to build over top of it. Now, what we've seen in our second nestings is most of the birds uh, slightly spruce up uh, the nest and maybe uh, build the cup up a little bit more, but uh, not a whole lot. Now, we do have a couple that have built up a lot more, uh, so it's got substantially higher within the box. But most uh, just sort of do some basic uh, sprucing. Um, now, other birds will clean out nesting material like wrens, and the the issue with old nesting material is it can lead to more ec uh, parasite, ectoparasites like these mites um, and blowfly larvae as well um, that just sort of accumulates over time and might lead to decreased nest survival in later nestings. So there have, have been a few studies uh, on what to do between nestings um, to the best thing for the birds. Now note, the bluebirds don't clean them out on their own. Uh, they Bluebirds will do some behaviors to sort of try to remove some mites and blowfly larva where they're sort of uh, ruffling through the, uh, the nesting material and trying to remove those, but they're not wholesale restarting the nest. Um, so a study in Illinois removed old nesting material from uh, some nest boxes uh, after fledging uh, and left others. Oh, okay, so this is uh, house wrens, but yeah. And they uh, they found no major difference. So with these house wrens between, no major difference between cleaned nest boxes and nest boxes that house wrens were cleaning um, in terms of mites. So that's uh, interesting that uh, the wrens at least were doing as good of a job as uh, the humans in terms of cleaning out uh, for ectoparasites. And here is a little video. I, I got some mites on my finger just to, just to show you guys what it looked like. These are little nest mites. And when I check this nest, the birds are gone, but the mites uh, are still there. So they're all over my fingers. And, uh, you know, after I was done shooting that video, I sort of I got all the mites off. I, I don't think they're necessarily harmful to us, but I got them all off. I washed them off and uh, shook them off. So. Now, 
Um, because bluebirds don't clean out the old nesting material, uh, it will become overfilled, especially uh, at the end of the season. So at the end of the season, you definitely want to clean that box out. Um, now, like I said, the question is, do you do it between nestings? So this study, and this is a bluebird study uh, in North Carolina, and after their first su successful clutch, they cleaned out half the boxes and left the, the others as is. Now, 71% of the bluebirds chose to move to a clean nest box in that study. So that seems to suggest that they do want a cleaner nest box, even though they don't do it themselves. And that's sort of what we're seeing here too, right? We've got um, seven of our 10 second nestings. So right at 70% have moved to the nearby clean nest box, either the NAVs or the FBS's boxes, or in one case, the Gilbertson. Now, uh, an opposite conclusion was reached in a, in a bluebird study in Kentucky. Um, in that study, the bluebirds preferred the nest boxes that hadn't been cleaned, that had the old nest in them. Um, there's uh, one caveat there is that there are parasitic wasps in Kentucky that will kill blowfly pupae over the winter. Uh, and so removing uh, the nesting material could actually compromise uh, that natural process in that case. So, I mean, ultimately, I think it's it's your choice if you want to clean out between nestings, uh, but you do want to make sure that you're not disturbing an active nest or disturbing the start of the second nesting. Um, so you want to be careful. Um, but even if you don't clean out between nestings, definitely clean out at the end of the season. And later, toward the end of our project, we'll have some videos about how to clean. But uh, we're not doing any cleaning just yet. So uh, if you do clean between clutches, make sure all your chicks have fledged uh, or it's a nest failure. In our case, we candled those eggs to make sure um, or uh, the nest has been inactive for over a month. So when you do go to clean your boxes, and we'll have a video on this later uh, in, in the summer, fall, Wear gloves and stand uh, with the wind to your back so that avoids that waste material blowing into your face. Uh, the nest, uh, you can take all that nesting material out, put it in a bag, and then put it in the trash. You want to brush out the interior of the box, and then when you're done, make sure you're washing your hands with soap and water. Um, and if there's any indication that have been mice in that nest box, you want to spray with a bleach solution um, because you want to make sure you're killing uh, any hantavirus that is inside that box because hantavirus can be dangerous to humans. Uh, so if you see signs of mice in your box at the end of the season, uh, use that bleach solution, wait a little bit, wear a mask, put that stuff in the trash, uh, and leave it open for a few days as well after you've applied that bleach solution. So uh, that's uh, a little bit about nest cleaning. Now I wanted to show, we had we always look in our nest after they've fledged. And most nests don't have anything but a couple of uh, poop sacks in them. And we had this one nest where it had a lot of extra plant material, um, in, or a lot of extra uh, leftover, I guess, food, animal uh, material that the adults had brought in, but the, the chicks didn't eat. And so I thought it was interesting to just see a little window into the diet of bluebirds, at least here. Uh, at the range cattle REC. And so we've got uh, a grasshopper and uh, a cricket here. And then uh, this, let's see if I can do the laser pointer error. So pretty sure this is part of a mole cricket. So that was interesting to see that in the box. And then we have a, a beetle as well. So it's interesting to see what they're eating. And another uh, grasshopper that we have here uh, in abundance at the range cattle REC is the Eastern uh, Lubber grasshopper. And that's uh, what these are here. So um, this is an adult and these are one of the juvenile stages of that grasshopper. Now these grasshoppers are really big uh, um, and they can become pests, especially of citrus and, and other ag agricultural crops because not only are they really big, but they also can be quite numerous. And uh, 
they're not preyed upon by a lot of things because they actually have some uh, poisonous glands inside them that are, are pretty unappealing to a lot of animals and can actually make some birds sick. Now, um, loggerhead shrikes are able to consume these grasshoppers and the way they do that is they capture the grasshopper spirit on the barbed wire or on a thorn and then they've learned to eat around uh, the poisonous glands in the grasshopper so they only consume the parts that aren't spoiled by the poisonous glands. So I don't know if bluebirds are capable of eating these or not. That's something I want to look into uh, and whether they do or not. So it'd be uh, interesting if if bluebirds could serve as a uh, uh, agricultural pest deterrent, um, especially uh, with citrus and some other issues. But if they're eating mole crickets, that certainly be, would be good. So um, I want to switch and talk about um, the different birds that we have in the rangelands here in Florida. And so Florida's rangelands are really sort of different than the rangelands in the rest of North America. The system here is is different than what we see in Wyoming and Nebraska or even in uh, Arizona and New Mexico. Um, and it's it's different because it's a lot wetter here uh, and it's more tropical uh, and it's also warmer uh, year round. Now uh, Arizona and New Mexico get pretty warm as well uh, but the higher humidity and the wetter conditions here make the rangelands in Florida unique at least uh, in the United States. And they're more similar to rangelands that we see in, in Brazil, for example. Now, Florida has um, nearly or over 5 million acres of what we call rangelands. And that's split between about 3 million acres, um, 3 and a half million acres of pasture and uh, open rangelands, and then a, an additional 1 and a half acres or so, uh, 1 and a half million acres of um, wooded uh, pasture. So, and there's a lot of different birds that will occupy these landscapes in Florida and play different roles based on what they're consuming and their impact on the system. Now, one of the, I would say, pretty iconic uh, birds in Florida's rangelands is the burrowing owl. It's a really unique bird. Uh, they're pretty small in terms of owls and they're unique in their behavior that they nest underground. Now they are active both day and night. Uh, they primarily eat insects, um, especially the females. Uh, and so things like grasshoppers, crickets, and moths and beetles. But the males um, will eat uh, small mammals like mice, voles, and shrews. Uh, but they do uh, go after anything that they can physically handle. And burrowing owls are neat in Florida because they've got a Burrowing owls have a really wide ranging distribution across the Western Hemisphere, but they're really isolated here in Florida, isolated from the population in Western North America, uh, Mexico, and then South America. So kind of unique in that, and uh, uh, that they stay here year round as well. And I sort of leads us into our first type of bird here in Florida's rangelands, and those are the raptors. Um, and so it's sort of a continuum uh, in terms of what these animals can consume uh, in size of the vertebrate prey. So uh, sort of the, at the lower end uh, is our burrowing owl and our kestrel. So kestrels uh, are the smallest and most numerous and most wise, widespread North American uh, raptor uh, or falcon, I guess. Uh, and they take a lot of arthropods and small vertebrates um, like grasshoppers, cicadas, and beetles, dragonflies, but they also take a lot of uh, small mammals like voles and mice. Now the kestrels will also take small songbirds as well. Now we also have uh, red-shouldered hawks. Now red-shouldered hawks, we see uh, them a fair bit uh, here at the range cattle RC. We Well, we've seen all of these birds so far at the range cattle REC. I just saw my first burrowing owl uh, this week, so I was quite excited about that. Actually, there's a they uh, saw them near one of well, probably about 100 meters away from one of our uh, bluebird nest boxes. So that was kind of neat. Um, but back to red-shouldered hawks, they're pretty common here at the REC. We've got one that nest uh, in the trees around the center buildings. Now. They'll take small mammals and reptiles, amphibians, 
and they can also take birds. Um, they will occasionally take invertebrates, but we're now moving a bit more towards animals that are specializing in larger prey. And then we have northern harriers here. Uh, northern harriers forage on the wing, right? So they're capturing a wide wet range of prey, including small and medium-sized mammals and birds. And they're doing that while they're coursing low uh, over the ground. And then next up in size is our red-tailed hawks. And they'll take a wide variety of vertebrates, uh, varying in size from rodents to rabbits. And they also will take snakes and birds like bobwhite, or up to bobwhite. And then I wanted to talk about crested caracara. So crested caracara is one of those other really unique uh, birds in Florida in that the population of crested caracara in the state uh, is uh, disconnected from the wider distribution of crested caracara in the Western Hemisphere. Um, and crested caracaras are sort of unique. They're, uh, they blend hunting, uh, active hunting, and scavenging. So the, they're quite common uh, around carcasses, and they will, uh, or they can at least, outcompete uh, vultures as long as there's not too many vultures uh, and chase the vultures away from a carcass to consume. But they also uh, will do a lot of hunting as well. So they're eating everything from insects uh, uh, up to small and occasionally even larger vertebrates. And this includes fish, reptiles, and amphibians, birds, and mammals. Um, and they'll also, if they find eggs, will consume those as well. Now, crested caracara here in Florida and uh, also in Texas have a really strong association with rangelands that have cattle on them. They really like the fence posts. They like that sort of improved pasture landscape. And then uh, we've got bald eagles on our rangelands here as well. Now, bald eagles have, typically have a really strong association with water. Uh, they hunt fish and waterfowl, uh, but they are also attracted to rangelands. And, and we occasionally see them at carcasses as well. So if we've got a, for example, when we occasionally see pig carcass in a field somewhere, we're gonna see uh, both the vultures, black and turkey, but also we often see crested caracara and bald eagles hanging out around it as well. Now, let's look at those carrion eaters. And so again, they occur sort of on a continuum, right? So the turkey vulture is almost exclusively scavenging. Um, they'll, uh, turkey vultures tend to forage solitaire, like alone, uh, but once one turkey vulture is eating from a carcass, that attracts other vultures to that carcass. And so often you see a large group um, of, um, turkey vultures on a carcass. I don't know what's going on here at the bottom of this. Um, you'll see a lot of uh, vultures on a carcass and that might've been initially started by a single turkey vulture. Um, turkey vultures are often the first to find carcasses because of, they have both an excellent sense of smell and sight. Um, and other vultures like the black vultures will piggyback on uh, turkey vultures. So piggyback onto the findings uh, of carcasses uh, that turkey vultures find. So black vultures will also uh, mostly scavenge, but they do occasionally attack uh, domestic livestock and some animals, especially if they're weak. Um, so I've seen videos of a group of black vultures harassing newborn calves, for example. Now, unlike turkey vultures, black vultures don't really have a great sense of smell. Uh, and so they do uh, rely uh, more on sight and also uh, on looking for cues of turkey vultures and following them as well. And black vultures can displace turkey vultures from a carcass. And then, as I said earlier, both the crested caracara and the bald eagle will also scavenge from uh, carcasses as well. Now, the loggerhead shrike is a sort of neat bird uh, in the rangeland system. So, it's an avian predator, but it doesn't really have the anatomy of those raptors, right? It doesn't have, it doesn't have really strong beaks and claws to grasp prey items. So uh, to get around this, it's sort of adapted uh, to use its landscape to help it. And so what it does when it captures some of its prey items, which include anything from arthropods like grasshoppers and dung beetles and, and things like that, all the way to amphibians and uh, small and medium-sized reptiles and even small mammals and birds, uh, they will impale those animals on either nearby thorns or in a lot of cases here, 
the barbed wire. And so by sticking the animal onto the barbed wire, they don't have to use their claws and beaks to hold the animal for very long. And then they can use their beak uh, to uh, consume the animal uh, while it's restrained on the um, barbed wire. And the other neat thing about them, as I said earlier, with those eastern lubber grasshoppers, is they can hunt uh, noxious prey items, so prey items that taste bad because of poison and or scent glands, or that, like I said, have poison glands, they will eat around them while those animals are sort of attached to barbed wire, eat around the glands that would have the poison or the foul uh, tasting uh, material. And those include monarch butterflies and lubber grasshoppers and some frogs. And then we have swallows, right? So swallows eat exclusively flying insects uh, at all times of year. Um, now swallows, and we've got the purple martin here, uh, the tree swallow and the barn swallow, those are probably uh, uh, our more common ones on the rangelands here in Florida. They will readily nest in artificial cavities. And in fact, especially the purple martins, they've come to almost exclusively a nest in artificial cavities, at least in Eastern North America. Now, because of this, all of these birds uh, now occur in these artificial um, nesting cavities in large colony-like groups. Um, but we don't actually think that that occurred naturally because natural uh, cavities didn't occur uh, in the same sort of density necessarily that a lot of these birds are able to access artificial cavities. Um, and so purple martins, despite nesting in large colony-like groups, they often hunt uh, for insects solitarily or in very small groups. However, tree swallows and barn swallows will swarm uh, in large groups hunting insect swarms. Um, now, barn swallows are a bit more associated with farming equipment and will uh, hunt flying insects that have been flushed by farm equipment. And you know, a lot of people might have heard that purple martins, for example, uh, can uh, help control mosquito populations, but there's not a lot of evidence that they're actually eating mosquito, mosquitoes because mosquitoes are flowing, flying, for the most part, relatively low to the ground, and purple martins and some of these other swallows mostly hunt uh, a little higher in the air and for bigger uh, insect prey. And then we also have flycatchers, right? So they're also mainly consuming insects. Um, and we've got three of them here. We've got the great crested flycatcher, the eastern Phoebe, and eastern kingbird. Now, uh, the great crested, great crested flycatcher is one of our own, is the only cavity nesting flycatcher here in eastern North America. Um, now, these birds will do some uh, catching. Uh, uh, fly catching in the air, but they also uh, do a lot of probing uh, as well and eating uh, insects off of leaves and, and such. But the Phoebe is probably our, our most, uh, of these birds at least, is the one that's eating the most uh, uh, animals on the wing and doing a lot of, uh, eating a lot of bees and wasps. And then we have warblers uh, that are also mainly eating insects and spiders. Uh, they do consume some plant material, uh, but for the most part, it's mostly insects, spiders, and other arthropods. And they have that same sort of bill shape that's really allowing them to do that. It's good for probing and gleaning insects off of vegetation, um, but they do capture them in other methods as well. And so we've a couple of our more common ones on the rangelands here. So we've got the orange crowned, um, uh, the yellow, well, that's the prairie, and then the yellow throat, uh, and a palm as well. And so we've seen a couple other types of warblers, especially in the winter, here at the REC as well. And then a really common bird here on the rangelands uh, at the REC is the eastern meadowlark. Now, meadowlarks uh, are much bigger than the warblers, and they feed almost entirely on the ground, eating mostly insects, lots of grasshoppers and crickets. Now, meadowlarks as a species are declining uh, in a lot, a lot of its range, um, and that probably includes parts of Florida, but they're really abundant, uh, at least locally, here at the range cattle REC. Now, as a group, these sort of rangeland birds, grassland birds, 
are declining across North America. And, and part of that is that a lot of the native grassland has been converted uh, to agriculture and livestock. And um, what we have remaining is either uh, uh, high intensity agriculture, especially in the Midwest, uh, and then we, uh, in other parts of our historic rangeland, we have uh, uh, cattle ranches and ranged cattle. And cattle ranches can be conducive, at least to some uh, grassland birds, especially if grazing is done in sort of a rotational way so that there's a mosaic of different uh, vegetation heights and types. And also, uh, at least in systems that uh, have evolved with fire, that fire maintain, is maintained through prescribed burning regimes as well. And so here in Florida, uh, um, the most successful uh, rangelands in terms of wildlife are places where they have rotational grazing and they have prescribed fire regimes that are allowing for that mosaic of habitats to occur on the landscape and allowing for a wide, device, uh, wide diversity of these species to continue, continue to persist. So we also have a couple important, uh, um, what we call shorebirds, uh, the egrets and the cranes in rangelands. And perhaps one of the most ubiquitous ones here in Florida is the cattle egret. So cattle egrets eat uh, insects disturbed by grazing animals, and they have a highly adaptable diet. So they're non-native. They arrived in, in Florida in the 1950s, but they're originally native to Africa, where they uh, developed this sort of relationship with the large grazing animals in Africa, for, for example, African buffalo. Now, in the 1930s, they were able to successfully colonize South America from Africa across the Atlantic Ocean, and from there uh, quickly spread north and across the continent. Now, what we don't see in this map is that uh, cattle egrets also expanded out of Africa across Europe and Asia and as well. So they're a really successful species that has come, become a, a global species. Um, and a lot of that is, is based on the changes uh, that occurred in the landscape um, and the introduction of cattle ranching in large parts of these areas. So this sort of successful colonization of South America couldn't have occurred uh, without uh, the sort of changing landscape of the Amazon forest to more uh, cattle ranching and pasture operations that allowed uh, cattle egrets to successfully spread uh, northward. And so they sort of spread northward across Northern South America. They entered Mexico, uh, they spread to the uh, Caribbean islands jump to Mexico, jump to Florida, and the race is on as they head northward across North America. Another bird we see a lot in the rangelands is killdeer. And so killdeer are mainly eating terrestrial invertebrates, uh, things like earthworms and grasshoppers, beetles and snails. They will occasionally take small vertebrates uh, and will occasionally eat seeds as well, but mostly uh, uh, eating the terrestrial inverts. Now, killdeer are one of those other species that have done really well with humans. So they're likely more abundant now than they were at any other time in the past. And that's because the sort of habitat that we create, uh, not only here in the rangelands, but also in suburbia, uh, is really good for killdeer. And you've probably seen these. Uh, they have that really unique behavior where they're trying really badly to convince you to go away from their nest by acting like they're injured. So they'll, they'll limp and make a lot of noise and act like they've got a, a a damaged wing, and they're trying to convince you uh, uh, and lead you away from their nest with that sort of display. Now I want to shift to birds that are more omnivoric, uh, so they're eating uh, almost equal amounts of plant and uh, uh, animal material. And the first one, uh, really abundant uh, locally in here in Florida, is the sandhill crane. Uh, these birds are large, opportunistic, omnivoric foragers. They consume a wide variety of plant material, small vertebrates and invertebrates. We see uh, them a lot on the rangelands. Um, they use uh, the whole landscape here, and, and they, uh, they come to some of the water that we've got out for cattle as well. And then uh, we've got a whole series of omnivorous blackbirds. Um, 
Now, for these birds, they're non-breeding season diets, mostly plant material, but then in the breeding season, their diet becomes mostly animal material. Now, but overall, these species are highly omnivorous, they're diet generalists, they eat about everything. And most of these species have done really well uh, with humans, and they're very abundant and common across their range. And so things like uh, the red-winged blackbird, and then uh, the common grackle, and also the, the boat-tailed grackle as well. Uh, now, common grackles can be a uh, significant agricultural pest, especially for corn. They eat a lot of corn uh, in places where that's growing and are quite the pest for that. And then we have the brown-headed cowbird. Now, these are famous for their brood parasitism. So brown-headed cowbirds only lay their eggs. They don't build their own nest. They don't maintain a nest. They lay their eggs in other birds' nests. So you'll see those photos of a warbler feeding a brown-headed cowbird's chick, which is a lot bigger than warbler chicks. Now, brown-headed cowbirds consume uh, a lot of plant material, and the plant material that they are consuming is mostly what we would call weed seeds. They're not, in most cases, they're not a large agricultural pest. And then we have the crows here in Florida. We've got fish, crow, and uh, American crow, and they're hard to tell apart where they uh, both occur. Um, the best way to tell them apart is the sound of their voice, so the fish crow is a bit uh, more nasally. Now, both of these birds are highly omnivoric, uh, and they are generalists. They'll eat whatever is abundant and available. And uh, crows can be important predators for certain pest invertebrates and larvae. So they're not necessarily bad uh, for agricultural systems. Another um, common bird that we see here on the rangelands, probably uh, definitely our most common woodpecker that I see around here is the red-bellied woodpecker. So it's a habitat generalist uh, extraordinaire, right? It can live in about any type of habitat because it consumes a wide range of uh, food items, uh, including fruits, uh, mast seeds, and then arboreal arthropods and invertebrates as well. And there's even reports of it taking small or young vertebrate prey opportunistic with it. And it is a primary cavity nester. So in this system, uh, without artificial nest boxes, Bluebirds would be relying on woodpeckers like the red-bellied woodpecker to find, uh, to create nests in areas for them. Uh, another really common omnivore here is the northern mockingbird. Northern mockingbirds mainly eat insects and fruit. They have a really uh, unique uh, voice uh, and it can be highly uh, variable among individuals. They, uh, they mimic a lot of different sounds in their landscape. Now, We'll talk about some birds that are mostly eating seeds and plant material. So we've got uh, some colorful seed eaters, uh, so cardinals, uh, blue grosbeaks, and goldfinches. Now these birds consume a lot of grass seeds among other plant material, and you can see uh, as we transition through these songbirds, the songbirds at least at first that are mostly eating insects like warblers, to the songbirds that are eating mostly plant material and seeds. And you can see that the, the beak of a cardinal and a gross beak and a finch, it's a lot stronger and more powerful. And that's because uh, they need that, that strength and that robust beak to, to crack into seeds and consume seeds. And so these birds will also be really common at feeders as well. Now cardinals consume about 30% animal material. Um, and the blue gross beaks can use that powerful beak to consume some insects and snails. Um, and then we've got the upland game birds, and so this is the wild turkey. Uh, the subspecies of wild turkey that's here in Florida is the Osceola turkey, uh, and it's famous for uh, the hunting opportunities it can provide. It's a little bit smaller than a lot of the other wild turkey uh, subspecies in North America. Now, wild turkeys are primarily eating dry, fleshy fruits, tubers, and seeds, and uh, uh, vegetation material of a lot of perennial plants. And turkeys, along with our uh, the next upland game bird that we've got here, uh, really like that sort of mosaic of landscapes, right? So they need, they need uh, areas with plant material, uh, with vegetation, they need that rangeland sort of landscape, but they also need uh, areas with cover so they can protect their poults and get some of those uh, 
seeds and uh, fleshy fruits from trees as well and mast. So they need that mosaic of habitat and do quite well uh, in places that are maintaining their mosaic through fire and rotational grazing. And then we also have the northern bobwhite, another really famous, really popular upland game bird. Um, they primarily eat seeds of agricultural crops and weeds, uh, and, but they're eating a lot of vegetation in general uh, from the understory. And uh, again, they're an edge uh, species, uh, so they need that sort of mosaic of landscape types. They're highly opportunistic, but the, they're fairly short-lived. Um, a really interesting bird. We see them along our margins a lot here at the range cattle REC. Really a fire-dependent species. And then we've got our grass, or our sparrows. Um, now, a lot of the sparrows here in Florida uh, are mainly wintering here. Um, so things like the savannah sparrow, the vesper sparrow, grasshopper sparrow, chipping, and henslows. Um, there are other sparrows here as well. Now, some of these species have unique subspecies that occur only in Florida uh, that don't migrate. So one famous example is the Florida grasshopper sparrow subspecies, and this is a critically endangered bird uh, that only occurs in a few places in Florida, and there's a really active uh, research and conservation effort around this species. Um, protecting it and figuring out how to increase its population. A lot of these sparrows are ground nesters. That includes the grasshopper sparrow. Um, and so their nests are susceptible to uh, fire ants, to um, mammalian carnivores like skunks, and, and also snakes. Now these birds, again, they've got a more robust beak shape than the, the warblers. They're about the same size as the warblers, but their beak is a lot more robust. And it's because they're mainly eating seeds. Uh, now, uh, they might supplement with some small fruits as well, but they mainly focus on seeds. Um, the year-round birds, the Florida grasshopper sparrow uh, subspecies, uh, there's a, a non-migratory Henslow sparrow as well, they'll supplement uh, their diet with insects, uh, primarily to feed uh, their young in, during the breeding season. So, uh, that's sort of a, a quick and uh, sort of overview of the rangeland birds, what they eat, and the different roles they play in the rangelands. So we've got birds like the raptors that are eating a lot of uh, vertebrate prey, and then we've got a lot of birds that are eating insects, a variety of different insects, so this, the swallows that eat the flying insects, uh, the flycatchers that eat flying insects and also glean, and then the warblers that eat insects by gleaning off trees. Um, and then we've got things like meadowlark that are eating insects off the ground, uh, and sandhill cranes, and uh, killdeer, and cattle egrets. And then we have our seed eaters and our omnivores as well. So I'm going to look at some of these questions here. So uh, Brenda suggests that allowing bluebirds to introduce uh, more nesting material, so one potential con basically what she's saying is if you're not cleaning out the nest box that are going to continue bluebirds are going to continue to add nesting material that's going to raise the height of the nest and then the chicks within that nest box are more susceptible to uh, avian predation predators like crows because the crows can more easily reach into the nest box so that's an important point uh, and that's certainly something that i think you have to take a into account when you make your decision about whether to clean out nest boxes between nestings. Um, but you do want to make sure if you do clean out nest boxes between nestings that you're not disturbing the second nest. And uh, let's see, Brenda also says, with regard to the leftover food stuff found in the nesting material, uh, Brenda has found a lot, of, a lot of large amount of cherry pits. So that's sort of an interesting uh, food item that I wouldn't have expected um, bluebirds uh, to be feeding uh, their young. So that's interesting. I, I want to look into that. Uh, for most birds, including bluebirds, the, the primary food source that they feed their young is, is insects because of the high protein content, uh, because these birds uh, are growing really rapidly. And rapid growth is really important. And then uh, Mike asked about the floor dimension of the Gilbertsons compared to the others. 
and it, it, it is a smaller floor. Uh, I don't have the, the numbers off the top of my head. We followed the dimensions uh, uh, on from the North American Bluebird Society website, but uh, I don't have them off the top of my head. But that, that's when we built our Gilbertsons, we followed those instructions. But it is a little smaller, so it, it's a tighter space for sure. But, you know, all six of those birds, uh, all six of those eggs, eggs hatched, all six of those chicks pledged. Uh, so at least with our N of one, it, it turned out okay. And Gilbertsons are used a lot uh, by bluebird researchers. And we're kind of hoping our next session, um, we're gonna have a bluebird researcher uh, come and uh, give uh, a talk uh, in our session about some of their bluebird research. So we're reaching out to a few folks and hopefully we can get someone to come on. Um, so we're switching up uh, the sort of uh, schedule of the, of these talks. You know, initially we were trying to do monthly, uh, but we're going to take a little bit of a break and return in July um, for our next talk, which will again give an, uh, a research update. Uh, we'll also uh, by that time be able to show some preliminary temp uh, logger data uh, from our first nest and also our uh, temp loggers that we've got out in nest boxes, unoccupied nest boxes at the same site. So we'll be able to show a little bit of that data in July, uh, give our research update, and then hopefully have a guest presenter talk about a little bit of their research uh, in uh, bluebird ecology here in Florida. So um, if there's any other questions, I can answer them. Otherwise, thank you all for, for, for tuning in and continuing to tune in uh, as we go through this research project together. So, oh, we do have a couple of things. Uh, Brenda pointing out that she's had great crested flycatchers use their her nest boxes, and uh, they use uh, snake skins in their nest box. So that's pretty interesting. I've heard of that as well. That's um, a I don't know if that is um, some sort of deterrent or just because it's soft and, uh, and uh, available in the landscape, something that attracts great cresteds and wants, uh, they want to put in there. I'd look into that a bit more. Um, so Joanne asked when in July. And so that's a little, uh, it's gonna be after July 4th. It's not gonna be, it was gonna be a Saturday and it's gonna be uh, mid July, but I, uh, our guest presenter, I want uh, them to confirm that date before I confirm the, the date with you all. But we'll send it out uh, very soon, as soon as we get a confirmation on that uh, from our guest presenter. And uh, yeah, it, I'm really looking forward to the guest presenter. I think uh, they'll present some interesting uh, information. Perhaps, I'm not sure what they'll talk about, but a lot of their research focuses on bluebirds uh, in urban environments or in suburban environments and the effect of noise on nest success and things like that. So I think it'd be a really interesting talk. So I'm really looking forward to it. Okay, thank you all for coming and uh, look for an email about uh, the date in July and probably in the meantime between then and now we'll be posting uh, some short videos on uh, our virtual classroom website with uh, some short research updates to keep you updated. I imagine by July, we could be looking at some third nestings for some of our birds. So exciting. All right, thank you.